I got introduced to Paul when he was in a duo with Steve Brooks. They were already doing some sort of shows, um, you know, around working um, uh, as a duo, but I think they wanted to put something bigger together. They wanted to put a band together. And so I got invited to do the uh, the big show we had lined up at Shearwater Youth Club. Um, and Paul just handed me loads of Chuck Berry records and said, right, learn as many of them as you can. And then the band sort of evolved where Dave Waller was involved as the rhythm guitarist. Paul was on bass at that time because he was a big Paul McCartney fan. Um, and it just went on from there. John then started to get involved and getting us some shows. Dave was, um, he was a bit of a Citizen Smith do you know what I mean? In character, in a lot of ways, you know, he was in, he was read a lot of politics and fly the red flag and all this sort of stuff, and he took life a little bit seriously at times. Steve was completely the opposite, really. Good guitarist, he was our lead guitarist, and did most of the lead vocals in the early stages. I mean, we were just young guys, I mean, out there having fun and enjoying doing what we were doing. We musically grew up with each other over that period. There's a lot to be said for that, that how we were all learning and evolving and getting into the way each of us reacted when we played. Dave Waller left, Steve Brooks left, Bruce got involved, um, and I think at that point Paul sort of thought, well, I, I'm not getting on too well with um, doing lead vocals and playing bass. Um, and so he said to Bruce, well, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to play bass uh, uh, and I'm taking over rhythm guitar. Um, uh, so that's how that change came about. And although we tried very hard to uh, just get a fourth member in, we had a piano player and etc. So no, nobody ever really stuck anyway. Um, so we always sort of ended up as a three piece, and uh, uh, that's the way it stayed. We got a regular slot at Michael's Club every three weeks out of every four or something. That was a great place because we knew we had a regular some regular work there, and. Um, I mean, it was a, it was a seedy little place. It was one of them places you went to uh, after the pubs had shut, mm. you know, because it didn't really open up and start business until about eleven o'clock at night. So most people were in party mood by the time they they turned up, you know. Um, and I think they had some sort of shady gambling den at the back as well. And Paul came back and said, oh, "I've just seen this really good band, you know," and told us all about it. And then, of course, it was only a matter of weeks later that that they started to. Uh, appear in the press because of the the whole punk thing had started to break, you know, um, and and then of course we got invited up to Dunstable to to support them. Uh, they were doing a sort of opening show, which was kept quite quiet, uh, as uh, um, you know one of their first shows to sort of give them a bit of a warm up before they'd done a proper national tour. And we went up there and played to about 12 people, you know, because they, nobody really knew anything about it, you know. I mean, and, and I think it was uh, Dunstable Civic Hall or something like that. And uh, so the attendance was really bad. But the Pistols were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And we just watched in awe that, that even though there was it was badly attended, that they still played, you know, their best and pulled all the stops out. And, you know, and I thought, well, that was a great example to to any band really, it doesn't matter whether you're playing to a, you know, one man and a dog sort of thing or, or the place was full, you know, they really just get, they really did give it everything. And what were the pistols like to you, you guys when you played, were they called Steve Jones and that lot complimentary? Or? No, <laughs> no they didn't really talk to us very much at all, you know, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I wouldn't say they disregarded us but I mean, we were just like the support band who turned up in suits. The image thing was a consensus that we wanted to be remembered. We started off in white bomber jackets and white kipper ties, white loafers and, and what have you. Um, and uh, it, it then moved on to get, having suits, uh, which we got from Hepworth's tailor off the peg. Three black suits, <laughs> cheap as chips. Um, and we thought, this is great. You know, this is, this is, I mean, they didn't fit us properly, but I mean, that didn't seem to matter. I mean, the, the feel goods were around and they were wearing sort of shabby old suits, you know what I mean? And, and also there was a throwback to the Beatles and them wearing suits. And, um, and so we, we still sort of carried this uniform thing through that we wanted to make a mark on, on being remembered. And I think it, from then that it sort of moved more into the moddy side of clothes. I used to work in a drawing office and my eyesight became really bad because I'm working real close all day long. So I had some glasses made, which were the frames. 
And then when I left the drawing office, my eyes improved because I wasn't constantly all day long working on little drawings and things. So I pushed out the, the lenses and cut some Polaroids up and shoved them in there. And because uh, I like the shape, I like the shape of the frames. I lost them one day uh, and somebody said, oh, here's a pair of dark glasses. And we were playing the Nashville rooms. So I said, oh, great. So I've stuck them on. I couldn't see bugger all. So I've staggered out into the, into the, onto the stage of the Nashville and I've walked into the drum kit and I can't see anything. And, uh, and it was just a complete disaster. So that's really when I sort of stopped, stopped wearing dark glasses. Some people used to think I was blind. I mean, I remember looking out on the audience and everybody going absolutely ape. Um, and that's really the biggest thing that I think I remember about it was the, the sort of heat and passion of it all, really. Um, from both sides, from the, from the audience and from us, I think we, you know, really used to love that, that hour. That, you know, we, everything that we did during that any day was worked towards that hour, hour and a half that we were on stage. One, two, two. Two, one, two, two. That sort of fan relationship came about because of the early days when we were doing the club, uh, the club scene, and uh, when we moved into London, was that people soon picked up on the idea that if they turned up at four o'clock, they could see the sound check, and that really just carried on. Um, that nobody really would stop anybody from coming in, no matter what the venue was. Um, later on, um, it was turned into a bit of a game that the venue had to sort of winkle all these people out before they locked the doors <laughs> and then let the official ticket holders in. You know what I mean? There's people hiding in all sorts of places. We did a couple of shows with the Ramones in the States. The first time I uh, ever remember, I don't know which one it was, they all looked the same to me, the Ramones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not being funny, but they did. You know, they all wore the same clothes and they had the same haircuts. One, I think it might have been Joey came into the... Um, the dressing room of the CBGB's club. I mean, uh, all this is in the book, really, um, to say hello and to sort of meet us and what have you, because he's obviously stayed to see see us play there. That was on the sort of first tour out there. Um, and CBGB's club was like New York's version of the, of the Marquee. It was a little seedy place that any, everybody had cut their teeth going through. Blondie had played there and everybody really in that sort of that era of American um, new wave. Um, yeah, no, he was good. It was uh, apart from the fact that he he sat on the electric fire, and I think he did. He set himself on fire. And the reasons I did it was because I just wanted to revisit the the jam numbers and play them and stuff. Um, having read through the set as we did our last show with the, with the jam, thinking I'm never going to play these numbers again, and given you know I take the opportunity of of doing exactly that and playing them again. So that was great. And then we found ourselves with Bruce come on board, um, and it, it, you know, I think it was nice to sort of reconnect to, to people and realise that the Jam fans were still out there and they, they were still into the music and. And they, and they bring their sons along, weren't they? they yeah, that's special. right. Yeah, it was another generation. <laughs> yeah, that another, another. Well, I started writing it because just writing things down, notes of memories yeah. of uh, things that had happened, and it sort of once it started taking shape and it started getting serious. I mean, it was yeah, it was good fun really. It was actually. It was quite, um, it was quite therapeutic to sort of run over all this old ground, you know, um, and especially there's even now there's things that I think, well, God, I should have included these sort of things. There's lots of, lots of little anecdotal stories, really, um, but most of it is is to do with, uh, you know, my memories of how I saw it from my point of view.